If you missed part one of this video, click here to see that now. Einstein, having reaped the rewards and successes of special relativity, was to set out on a journey to apply his newly found theory to all reference frames, including those that are accelerating or being influenced by gravity. This work started in 1907 and would take Einstein another eight years to complete this mammoth task. However, the starting points to all of this can be thought of in the following thought experiment. Imagine yourself standing here on Earth. Your body is acted on by gravity, and the force that you feel from it is equal to your mass multiplied by g, the gravitational field strength. Now picture yourself standing in a rocket in outer space. If the rocket is not moving, you will feel weightless, but if the rocket is accelerating, you will feel a force acting on you, almost as if you are in a gravitational field, like back on Earth at home. This is similar to the feeling of being pushed into your seat when a car accelerates, and the artificial gravity that can be created in a rotating spacecraft. If we set this acceleration to a value of 9.8 meters per second squared, the same value as g, you would not be able to tell the difference between standing in a rocket and standing on Earth, aside from all of the pretty stars and space stuff you get in a rocket. This means we can think of gravity as a constantly accelerating reference frame, and so a start to incorporating gravity into relativity could be via this route. Remember that the issue with special relativity is that it only applies to non-accelerating reference frames. The important point of producing a new description of gravity was that the Newtonian model had grown old and was beginning to break down under many different circumstances, including the orbit of Mercury. This had been noted within 100 years of Newton's theory being published, and the issue is that although Newton's model was incredibly useful and important back then, it didn't quite cover every last detail. Mercury's orbit was studied in depth, and it turned out that the orbit predicted by Newton's theory was slightly different to the true orbit of Mercury. If a new model was to be proposed, it could explain this difference, making it applicable to the rapidly growing study of astronomy. The implications of perfecting a model for this were huge. To solve such a problem would take Einstein on a journey through complex mathematical procedures that he hadn't learnt about yet, as the solution is described in a completely different set of mathematics to how special relativity was formulated. The early stages of development came in 1907, when Einstein noted that a body in freefall under gravity feels almost as if no forces are acting on it, just like how you feel weightless when initially jumping in a skydive. From this, he could apply special relativity to that case, as it is an inertial frame of reference, and so hypothesized the existence of gravitational time dilation, the idea that clocks ticking next to large bodies, such as the Earth, run slower compared to clocks ticking a long way away from Earth. This was only a start, and after a few more approximations over the years, Einstein travelled back to Zurich to accept a professorship, where he met with a classmate from his days studying there to learn all about Riemannian geometry, an area of mathematics which would be the key to describing his theory of relativity, applicable to all cases. After years struggling through this problem, Einstein finally came up with a solution in 1915, and published the end result, his theory of general relativity. Now, unfortunately, the concepts included in this are far too detailed and complex to go into any depth for a single video, but the basic ideas are truly exciting and fundamental to our universe. The gist of general relativity is that it describes gravity in a geometrical kind of way. It also includes the idea that space and time are woven together, they can't be separated and form a so-called space-time fabric. This is a piece of jargon that gets bandied around very often, but what actually are the implications of this space-time fabric? Well, if we view it as a sheet, much like a large piece of lycra, we can visualise gravity as simply being the curvature in this fabric. Objects with a higher mass will give more curvature than objects with lower mass, and it's the mass that causes the curvature in the first place. The curvature is the effect that we know as gravity, and gives us this geometric representation of it. Obviously there has to be more to it, 
as this space-time sheet is only two-dimensional. We would in fact need a three-dimensional sheet to give a true representation, but this can be quite hard to visualise. Other implications of general relativity include gravitational redshift and gravitational lensing. You may have come across redshift before, and this is the effect in which the frequency of a wave is altered depending on the relative velocity of the source to the observer. Gravitational redshift is the effect where the frequency of a wave can be altered as it travels out of a gravity well, so super dense stars should emit light that is more redshifted than you would expect. Gravitational lensing is another awesome application of general relativity, and comes from the fact that light can bend around massive objects. This bending in light means that the light can take many paths around this object to reach an observer, and so can seem like the light source is in multiple places. All of this is cool stuff, but the biggest implications of general relativity were yet to come. In fact, all sorts of things were being discovered about physics that nobody knew before, and discoveries were being made worldwide. Arguably the largest discovery though was to come from the least likely of places, the Russian Front. It's here where a German named Karl Schwarzschild had found a solution to Einstein's equations, and the result was quite profound. Schwarzschild had found that if you condense lots of matter into a tiny space, the resulting object would create such a large gravitational well that the light emitted from it would be redshifted beyond the visible range. In fact, it would be redshifted so much that the wavelength would be infinite, and so the escape velocity would be higher than the speed of light. These sorts of objects are now known as Schwarzschild black holes, and describe a type of body that was very controversial at the time, the black hole. Einstein himself rejected the notion that these objects could even exist on our universe, as they seemed to defy all logic and reasoning, and the equations surely couldn't be valid under these extreme densities. However, we now have evidence that black holes exist in our universe due to another phenomenon predicted by general relativity, gravitational waves. Remember that space-time fabric? Well, gravitational waves are ripples in the sheet of space-time, and can be produced by two black holes orbiting each other and gradually merging. It's these ripples of space-time that we can detect here on Earth using the LIGO detectors, and has added to the bank of evidence that these black holes, which Einstein didn't believe in, are present in our universe, and were predicted by one of the most revolutionary theories of all time. So, how did Einstein discover relativity? Well, I believe that it's a combination of his ability to build an argument from the ground up, and a very strong grounding in mathematics. Not only did he revolutionise science in 1905, but just 10 years after this, he had published a theory which we still use to this present day to describe our universe. He was truly one of the greatest minds of all time, and has opened the door to so many new concepts and discoveries about the world in which we live. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, then you might like to see how our world works on a day-to-day -day scale. Click here for just that.